What are the major arguments against practicing polyamory? Well, first, polyamory is just wrong. It's either multi-amory or polyphilia, but mixing Greek and Latin roots is just wrong. Still not convinced? Okay, well, many people claim that polyamory is a great idea in theory, but just not practical. It paints an idyllic picture of human psychology wherein any challenge can be overcome by communication, vulnerability, and rationality alone. But human beings aren't rational. We are deeply complex and messy and flawed. Some argue that polyamory doesn't take into account the reality of feelings, of human feelings of jealousy, of possession, feelings of insecurity and fear of abandonment that naturally arise. And of course, the, the flip side of experiencing so much love is an inordinate amount of heartache and heartbreak. And having a greater number of partners increases the overall amount of emotional support a person needs to provide. Sometimes people just go through long bouts of depression, sometimes lasting months or years. If your partner doesn't have a firm commitment and they do have the opportunity to explore sexually and romantically with other people, do you actually believe that your partner will stick through this difficult time with you? Uh, would you? Another argument here is just time. I, they say that love is unlimited, but time is not unlimited. Uh, many people can't find enough time to adequately support one partner, let alone two or three or four. And this scarcity of time causes difficult choices to be made. I mean, one could envision a polyamorous utopia wherein all partners are treated to equal time and equal affection, where all your lovers are invited to your sister's wedding. But honestly, this is just rarely the case. Under normal circumstances, a hierarchy, a pecking order, is almost always established. And for the primary partner to be downgraded from their exclusive seat of supreme importance in the mind and heart of their lover down to just someone on the side can be absolutely devastating. And even if this does all sound worth it to you, finding partners can be extremely challenging. Uh, potential romantic partners often get scared away by the word polyamory, assuming that any involvement with a polyamorous will invariably lead to heartbreak. And once you do find partners, the expectation that all your partners will get along swimmingly is misguided. I, I mean, sometimes that unicorn polycule is achieved where all partners involved love one another. But this is extremely rare. There usually is some friction between partners. Now, it's presumed that all of this potential for heartache and jealousy and fear can be remedied through conversation. But this often leads to exhaustive, tiring amounts of communication, tearing apart the nuances of every single action and feeling and this leaves many polyamorists longing for the days of having one simple, unshakable rule. Don't have sex with other people. And even if you do find that right person, and even if you do find the right complementary partners, and you find the right communication skills to navigate them smoothly, and everyone involved gets along, sometimes coming out as polyamorous is compared to is coming out as being gay. I mean, how would your family respond if you brought home two lovers for New Year's Eve dinner? And once the relationship gets more serious, the children have to be considered. It can be extremely beneficial to be raised by several parental figures, but if one parental figure were to leave and there wasn't the institution of marriage stopping them, it can be extremely devastating for the child. Now. To the argument that polyamory is somehow more natural than monogamy, some pro-monogamists say, yeah, polyamory is more natural, but there are many things that exist in the natural world that we do not value as human beings. Murder is natural. Physical violence is natural. Rape is natural. But as human beings, 
we've collectively decided that some parts of our nature are extremely beneficial to transcend. Uh, maybe polyamory is natural, but maybe we must transcend this piece of our nature. Now, why might it be beneficial to transcend this piece of our nature? Well, maybe people have the presumption that if the world were polyamorous, that everyone in the world would have more love. But if we look at the animal kingdom, this actually isn't the case. You see, more than 90% of mammals practice polyamory. They practice not only polyamory, but polygyny. That is, one male with multiple females. And as a result, we see what's come to be known as the Pareto distribution, or the 80-20 rule. That is, in the animal kingdom, about 80% of females are partnered with only about 20% of the males. And this can be good for competition and for increasing survival of the fittest. But in other ways, this can lead to a big problem. It's been argued thoroughly that one of the primary reasons human beings have so successfully dominated the planet is our unique ability to cooperate in such large numbers. But if only 20% of the males have female sexual partners, there would likely be an unprecedented amount of fighting and competition within our species. Our ability to collaborate as a species would crumble. So a remedy for this fighting would be to ensure that every one male has one female. Marriage. Monogamy. Now, the last major argument made against polyamory here is around the concept of sacrifice. Ancient cultures and religious stories uphold the value and virtue of sacrifice. One such story is the story of Abraham and Isaac, which can be found in several religious scriptures. Now, according to the story, though Abraham and his wife Sarah prayed incessantly for a child, it wasn't until Abraham's 100th year that Sarah conceived. Then, after his birth, Abraham was instructed by God to take his son up to a mountaintop and sacrifice him. So, following God's orders, after tying his son to an altar, Abraham pulled out his knife, ready to slit his son's throat. And at the last second, an angel came to stop him. Even if you believe that these stories aren't true, it doesn't really matter. Uh, perhaps it's still worth considering the ancient wisdom that these stories might hold. Why was this story considered to be of such importance that our ancestors passed it along for thousands of years, first by word of mouth, then text, then enshrining it in the institution of religion? What exactly is the moral here? Uh, that we should have blind faith in God, and that if we're schizophrenic and hear voices that tell us to kill somebody, that we should listen to them? Is that the moral here? Maybe. Or maybe, as some theologians have argued, this is a story about the importance of sacrifice. We don't have many practices of sacrifice today. We don't sacrifice our goats or our crops. And when we do make sacrifices today, they're usually for some practical means, giving up alcohol or giving some donations. But is there a different value of sacrifice, an affirmative value of sacrifice? Maybe it's exactly because Abraham and Sarah had waited so long to conceive a child that this was the perfect object to sacrifice for Abraham to prove his devotion to God and the spiritual path. And maybe it's because we crave love and romance and new relationship energy so much that this is exactly what we should sacrifice to be all in, to affirm our devotion to our partner. But maybe you disagree.